Hi, I'm Rachel Wilson here with Chicago Public Libraries U Media. We're so excited to have another Speak On It author chat today with Danielle Clayton. Danielle Clayton is the author of the Bells series and with Sona Chirapotra, co-authored The Tiny Pretty Things and Shiny Broken Pieces, which are being adapted into a TV series for Netflix. Danielle and Sona also co-founded Cake Literary, a media and content company based in New York City which is dedicated to diverse concepts for kidlet, middle grade, teen, and women's fiction readers across various platforms, including books, film, and television. Um, thank you so much for being here with us today, Danielle. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Uh, we wanted to start off just by sort of asking you, how did you get started with writing? What, what initially got your writing bug going? Actually, it was an accident. So I didn't want to be a writer. I wanted to be a doctor because I was like, I'm going to be fancy and like have like this job where I save people's lives. And I went to college and I majored in pre-med and then I failed chemistry. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, what am I going to do? It's really hard. Chemistry is very hard. And so um, I was doing really well in my English classes. I always had, I was such a great reader. And I was depressed being away from home. I'm the spoiled little rotten egg uh, of a child <laughs> and as an adult. And I just kept trying to, my mom was like, you need to find coping mechanisms. Why don't you start reading the books that you loved as a kid? Like you can't come home every weekend. I was coming home every weekend from college because I just missed being home. So I did and I realized I was like, oh, I loved reading books when I was a kid. So I thought I'll just be a teacher and a librarian. I'll be a book bully. I'll tell small people, these small children, what to read. Um, Cause librarians are the best people in the world. And so I was, I became a librarian and a teacher. And I thought this was great, but I got my master's in children's literature where I had to read the entire canon of children's books. And once I did that, I realized that there were so many kids missing from that canon. And I, was forced to take a creative writing class during that master's program. And I thought, this is awful. I don't know, oh, this is so painful, it's so hard. But one of my professors, her name is Hilary Holmesy, she said, you're gonna be a fabulous librarian, but you're also a writer. And I said, no, I'm not, no, I'm not. And I just, she kept making me write. And she basically turned me into a writer. And so I was like, fine. And that's the type of person I'm like, no, 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 no. And then I'm like, maybe, 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 yes. <laughs> and so um, I decided to try to write. And I just wrote a whole bunch of books, failed at it, revised them, failed at that, did it again, rinse and repeat. And once I met Sona, we ha just had a great synergy. And we were like, let's try to write a book together. Then we do it as a unit. And so that's how I sort of became accidentally slipped into writing also because I wanted to give the children of, that were coming to my library fun things to read and things that they could be very excited about that featured people who looked like them mm -hmm. because my library was in East Harlem in New York and it was all brown kids and they didn't have as many options at the time. This was about six years ago. And so, so yeah, that's, I fell into this. It's very accidental, which people are like, really? I'm like, really? Really? I thought I was going to be a doctor. Uh, I love those people who can kind of just magically tell you, this is what you're meant to be. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's so, that's so great. Well, what kind of books were you into as a young person? Oh my gosh. I was an avid reader. I was reading three or four books a week. Um, and my father is a huge reader. And so I was pulling things off of his shelf. But first I was obsessed with Harriet the Spy. I think that's a book I reread over and over again because yeah. it was the first time I felt like a grumpy girl, specifically a female bodied girl person, could didn't have to be sugar and spice and everything nice. And I felt like this pressure as a little person um, at like seven and eight that I couldn't have like strong feelings about like, I don't like this thing. I had to be nice all the time and Harriet put all her feelings in this notebook. And so I got a notebook just like Harriet's and I filled it with all my feelings. And so Harriet the Spy, A Wrinkle in Time, The Phantom Tollbooth. Um, I read those over and over and over again until my father was like, it's time to move on. And he started giving me The Hobbit and he was a he's a science and fiction fantasy nerd. 
So I started reading things from, trying to read things from his shelf uh, and, and fell in love with fantasy. So, but I started with that grumpy, grumpy girl, Harriet, and then read my way also through all of Virginia Hamilton's work. Um, oh. Very much obsessed with her uh, because I felt like she was writing stories straight out of my family. So I was voracious. My librarian was tired of me because I was always <laughs> like, more please. Um, or I'd make like a little diorama of the book that I would read. I had read. I was a very crafty kid. Um, and like, look, I read the book. I wrote you a book report that you didn't ask for. And I made uh, a diorama of the world. Look at me. I'm so excited. I just, I was like nerdy. That's kid. so great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love what you said about the grump, the grumpy little girl. And mm -hmm. I, I mentioned before we started that I was just looking back at the everlasting rose, which is the sequel to the bells. And I noticed that the in uh, the inscription was to to all the angry girls. Yes. There's nothing wrong with you. I may be misquoting, yes. but yes, exactly. Is it, do you see that as like an extension of that sort of like it's okay to have feelings? It's okay to absolutely because I believe that when I was an adolescent and when I was even just you know coming from kindergarten all the way through, I felt like there was one way to be the right kind of girl, and that was being nice and pleasant and agreeable all the time. And I was an, I am an opinionated person and I all came out the womb that way where I was like, oh, I don't like that. It's okay for you to like it, but I don't like it. So I'm going to do what I like to do and like, thanks. <laughs> and so that wasn't always. <laughs> and my parents gave me so much freedom to figure out who I am and who, and the things that I like and the things that I don't like. And they never really forced me into anything. So I didn't see that kind of girl reflected on the pages. There was always a certain kind of personality and I wasn't that. And I wanted to have the freedom to not like certain things and not want to do certain things and to have a lot of feelings. So mm -hmm. anger and sort of like, nope, saying no, I don't like a thing felt sort of off limits to me. And I just wanted to empower all of the young readers that like, being aggressively yourself is like the best way to be. Even if that means I'm not a kid who wanted to go to camp, hated camp, you know, that's okay. I just wanted to be indoors with making crafts mm -hmm. and reading my book and making soap. <laughs> like, and that's okay too. And I wanted to give more variety of the types of types of people and things that you can be into and that it's okay to not like what everybody else likes. March mm -hmm. to the beat of your own drum, do your thing. That's what the cliche is, but it's really real. Um, so, yeah, um, I, I, I wonder if you could give us just, we've talked a little bit about both of your series so far, mm -hmm. but, um, give us like just a little overview about the tiny pretty things series and, and how that came to be. Absolutely. So I used to teach at a ballet boarding school in Washington, DC. It was my first job out of college. I was, go I was a resident advisor and then I was the English teacher for many years. And I saw how wonderful and beautiful my students were. And when I met Sona in New York, we were both obsessed with the TV show, Pretty Little Liars Same. and the mystery <laughs> element. I mean, it was like a guilty pleasure. It was so good, so stressful. And I thought, man, I wish that there were stories where black girls and Asian girls and everyone got to just be embroiled in a mystery and that it wasn't about slavery, civil rights, painful, it's sad to be brown, blah, 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 blah. Um, and so I was like, let's do that. And then I told her that I worked at a ballet school and how intense and competitive it was and how the, the a lot of kids struggled. And we came up with this book series. And so I really, really wanted to do something that was just a book about ballet, but it featured diverse characters and characters whose backgrounds determined how they moved through the industry or through that very insular world. And it was like a great, it was so much fun. And I'm super excited to have it premiere on Netflix very, very, very soon. Yes. So, so how in did, a couple of weeks. How did that take place? How did, so, how did it end up becoming a series? It, we got really lucky. So um, we had a wonderful producer and uh, named Jordana Freiberg. 
and Insurrection Media who came and said, we want to make this into a beautiful show that really explores the love and the heartache of that is ballet. And so they put it together and Netflix really loved it. Really, really loved it. So, great. yeah. So I feel like in, in that book, you really do get a sense both of the love for the art form and also the, the pain and the self-management and, and self-regulation um, that goes into striving for, for perfection. Um, Absolutely. It's super stressful. Yes. It seems, it seems like that's a kind of a theme for you. Is... <laughs> yes. <laughs> a theme in my work. <laughs> <laughs> like the, that, that pressure to sort of be, and, and I know that, you know, in that, in that book too, it seems like a lot of the times the characters identities are weaponized against them. Absolutely. I wanted to have an honest conversation about how much your identity does influence how you move through the world and how certain obstacles in front of your path, but also how resilient one can be. So we wanted to be honest. And I feel like part of that, we had to be honest about the ballet world in particular and how everyone, it's already competitive, but it, it's an added layer of competition when you come from certain communities. So that was, a, that we were very, very invested in making sure we were honest, as honest as we could be, but also that it's still just a good story about some wild, wild girls who want to be the best and want to be the best artist they can be, but also they're willing to go to desperately means mm -hmm. to get that goal. I love all the scheming. It's, yeah. it's really fun. <laughs> what what do you what misconceptions do you feel like people have about ballerinas and dancers? I think they believe that they're not athletes. They don't realize how much athleticism goes into being a ballet dancer. It's just like being an athlete. Um, so they they train their bodies constantly. Um, I think they don't realize that. And this is what the show gets into, which is beautiful, that ballerinas sort of relationship to food goes across all genders, that people who are in the dance world, their body is their instrument, they're often perfectionists, and they train their bodies, and that some of these pitfalls or some of these traps that people fall into because of the obsessions, it goes across to everybody. Mm -hmm. So, and that boys who do ballet are just are important and it's interesting and they face a lot of discrimination for loving the art and loving this tradition and so I think seeing them on stage and seeing boys who love to dance is going to be amazing um, for a lot of people and I'm because there's so much just homophobia misogyny toxic masculinity, all of these things that I think contribute to the way that uh, ballet dancers are treated and why one would love, loves the art form, which is a very old art form. So mm -hmm. I'm excited to see all of those conversations that people are have been trying to have in the ballet world come to the limelight as the show is discussed. Yeah, well. yeah. I think, I think it'd be really, really fun to see it on screen. Yeah, I can't wait, I can't wait. <laughs> um, and, and so for you and Sona as co-authors, what was that process like? How did you navigate writing together? So we have opposite skill sets, which is perfect when you collaborate. So she's a plotter and an, sort of an architect and very good with plot. And I'm character and world. So I let her build the scaffold. And then we each took a different character and then we split one. And then we went through each other's chapters to make sure everything was cohesive and everything tracked correctly. And so sometimes she would leave things for me to fill in and I would leave things for her to fill in so that she could play to her strengths. She's very good with certain things and I'm good with certain things. So we are very smart in that we divvy, divide and conquer. Um, but it was so much fun to create these wild books because we would call each other two o'clock in the morning. This is what happens. We should do this or... You know, things like that, because it's really, mysteries are really hard. Mystery writers, hats off to you. They're so hard to make sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I feel like part of what you're um, wrestling with in that book too is that you 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 have first person points of view, and so when you're in a character's head, you can't you have to sort of regulate like what do they give away, yeah, um, to keep the mystery going. Um, so that that must have been an interesting puzzle to work out. Absolutely, and also um, it's hard to remember things when you're all right when we're both in different areas of the book and then also we didn't know who did it after the first draft so we we <laughs> wrote ourselves into like a nightmare hole of like and i was like well who did it well what do you think i'm like i don't actually know like we didn't talk about this as we were doing it and she's like we have to figure out who did it because we made everybody a suspect but we didn't decide so yeah <laughs> <laughs> we fell into pitfalls like that where Soda and I would be on the phone for hours like, but what do we do? And then we would call our editor and say, we actually don't know. <laughs> She'd be like, figure it out, friends. Get it together. You're, sp you're the writers. You're supposed yeah. to know this. And so we had to go into HarperCollins and like plot and chart everything out and figure it out. And we were just like, okay, because we wanted to be twisty and good. but Right. Twisty is exactly the word I kept thinking. Like, oh, yes, <laughs> um, <laughs> so hard. It's so hard. It's hard. That's one way to avoid not giving it away, though. I know. Avoid giving it away. <laughs> what happens when you don't know? When you don't know what you've done. Mm -hmm. So, well, I'm curious how much involvement the two of you had with the producers for the show. We actually didn't have much involvement at all. We got to read uh, the pilot script and we got to talk to the producers and then we got to go on set. And I think it was great. I think it was good for our first adaptation together. I think it was good that we had some distance, like our books are the books and then the show is the show. And we got lucky that we have a wonderful producer who really, I think, captured the heart and the spirit of the books. And I think, um, it's the best thing ever. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. I want to make sure we talk about the bells as well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so would you would you be up for giving like a little um, synopsis idea of what, what the bells is all about? Absolutely. So when I pitch the bells, I always call it, um, I always say it's like, if you like Scott Westerfeld's Uglies, it's Scott Westerfeld's Uglies meets Marie Antoinette's Court set in a world where everyone is born looking a little strange. However, there are these women called the Bells that can change you down to your bones for the right price. And I really wanted to explore sort of how bad could things get if everyone was competing over this idea of who could be the most beautiful. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so that's sort of my pitch. I also love that, that ugly series. Um, it, I, I'm, I'm, want to say that your books, they have um, some things in common with some series that we might be familiar with, like like Scott Westerfeld's work or mm -hmm. like the selection, the idea of competition or things like that. But I feel like they're so fresh because you've brought in this world building element that makes them really unique and different. Um, and I'm, I'm interested to know sort of what's your process for world building? What do you where do you start with that? Absolutely. I always start with world. There are some writers that start with character first and I start with world. And it's really, I ask myself a question. And this book came out of a question I had as a teenager, like 13, 14. And I thought sort of why do people get treated differently, women specifically, because of the way that they look? And why are certain body parts and, and certain aesthetics and the way people wear their hair and do their makeup, why does that create, like, people get more friends, they get more money, they get more whatever. And I wanted to build a world around this idea of decadent beauty. And so I started with the history. So I went back and I said, okay, how did people start adorning themselves? So I looked at the history of makeup and I thought, how do I love, I love lipsticks. I don't wear any other makeup but lipstick. And I thought, how did the lipstick come to be? So I went back to, it was like the ancient Egyptians and the Greeks and back in the day, right? And I looked at all of these textbooks and I looked at the history of beauty and all of these, and as it became more and more modern, France and Japan and Korea jumped out. And so I was like, okay, 
these are the titans of the beauty industry or have been over the years. Now let's talk about, let's go deeper and look at sort of why and how and how do they do it. And so out of that, I birthed the world of the bells. I thought, okay, I'm going to blend this. I'm going to make a secondary world that feels very much like France, but with highlights of Japan. So we have tea houses and we have rituals and um, we have, uh, they wear these huge inspired buns that are across between sort of the Marie Antoinette hair tower and the geisha bun. It's a bell bun in the middle. And I thought, I'm going to take all of this iconography that is beautiful, that has created these beauty industries. And I'm going to sort of dismantle it so that teenagers can have a frank conversation about all of this stuff that they're inundated with about beauty and the topic of beauty. So I started with just building this world from scratch and thinking about what is their currency? What does it look like? Why does it look that way? What are their creation myths? What are the lies that they tell about it themselves? And then I found my character inside of that by finding the troublemaker who could make the most trouble in the world. And so that's usually how I build all of my worlds. It starts with like a history and like my little weird obsessions with things. So with lipsticks and with, you know, I would go into <laughs> Sephora and go into uh, department stores and the smell of the products would get me so excited that I usually, I used to believe when I was 12 and 13 that they were magical and that they might make my, I had very bad cystic acne go away, which is not true. Mm. So yeah, so Sadly that's where I started. Yeah, I started my world building with history, with the history of it. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question from um, Amy D. Uh, who wants to know, do you prefer writing with a partner or by yourself? I love both of them. When you write with a partner, what's so great is that you're not by yourself. You're not, you're not on your own. So what I love about writing with Sona is that if I don't want to write a scene or if I'm struggling, I'll say, hey, I need help with this. And I can leave it and she can come back, write a little bit and then help me out. And I do the same for her. For example, I don't like kissy kissy scenes. I find them very stressful and I wait till the last minute to write them. The kissy kissy boom boom is what I call it. And I literally write there, Sona, fill in kissy kissy boom boom here. I'm moving on. And she didn't like writing the dance scenes. So I wrote the dance scenes because one, I was working at the ballet school. I worked at the ballet school, so I saw a lot of it. And she was like, oh, these are so exhausting. I have to watch all these videos. And um, so I was like, look, I'll trade you a kissy kissy boom boom scene for a dance scene. And so that's what we would do. And so that was great. But when I was writing the bells, I was all by myself. I couldn't, I had to write all those. And so it was very stressful. <laughs> So there are pros and cons to both, um, but it's nice to have somebody in the trenches with you. Mm -hmm, I bet. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, and I know that you're part of the, um, I believe you're an officer for We Need Diverse Books, is that right? Mm -hmm. I'm COO, yeah. Yeah, and um, that you, I'm sure that that has a community vibe, you know, do you, do you look to other authors in your community for either support with your writing or advice on what you're working on? Absolutely. I keep a core group of wonderful friends and writers that you probably know, some of them. Um, I'm just thinking Nick Stone, Angie Thomas, Tiffany Jackson, Ashley Woodfolk, Jason Reynolds, Zoraida Cordova, Natalie C. Parker, I'm, I'm thinking about all the people that I'm always complaining about in my phone uh, to, <laughs> about books or who read my work for me and I read for them. Um, Adam Silvera, Becky Albertalli, Nicola Yoon. So I was able to create a community for myself. Um, and, and what's great is that my fantasy people like Bethany C. Morrow and Elle McKinney and Karen, Karen Strong, I can go to with my, oh my God, fantasy, I'm dying. I hate this thing, right? I have my fantasy crew. Then I have my contemporary crew, which I listed. Mm -hmm. um, and I love it because it's both sides of my brain. It's both sides of the things that I love. And I just knew when I came in this industry that I needed to collect a whole bunch of like wonderful, wonderful humans because it's really, really hard. It's very hard. Writing seems like fun, but it's really rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. And sometimes you just hate everything. I always feel like 
whenever I'm drafting, I'm like Oscar the Grouch. I live in a trash can. My book sucks. There's papers everywhere. I'm eating trash. Like I'm just, I eat really bad food when I'm on deadline because I can't think. So I'm like, I'm grumpy. I'm tired. I'm up till two or three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and so having other people also that live in trash cans nearby, and we're just like in our little community of grumps, like trying to get to deadline. It's super helpful. It's super, super helpful. How do you find that balance between the negative, the negative unhelpful voices and then the, the legitimate criticism and how do, how do you balance those two things? I don't go looking for, for it. So I don't read reviews. Um, I think that reviews are for readers. They aren't for me as the creator. Sometimes I'll read trade reviews. Those are the only ones because most of them are from um, librarians and I was a librarian. So I love librarian feedback. However, my most important critic, the most important people to me are kids. So when I go to uh, events and when I go to festivals and I go to school visits, that's when I talk to kids and say, okay, let's talk. Give me the give me the whole tea on how you feel about books and which ones you like and why you like these and why you don't. It like clicks into my librarian mode, my you know, uh, readers advisory and like just talking. I love talking to them about what they like and what they don't like. So I try to protect my inner writer and my inner little soul from all of the the negativity because it doesn't help me create. And the way that I get better is by having other writers give me feedback and listening to librarians and talking to librarians, especially at conferences about things that they're seeing, but I just don't go seeking out those things. Sounds wise. Yeah. <laughs> especially at this time, it's very mm -hmm. stressful. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Well, I want to, you, you just mentioned that you announced your new middle grade series, the marvelers. Um, yeah. Do you want to give us a, give us an idea about what, what's coming with that? I'm so excited. So congratulations. Middle, thank you so much. Middle grade is actually are actually the first books that I started writing, but I got lucky with YA first breaking into the marketplace. So this is the book of my the little book of my heart. And this is only the second time I've gotten to talk about it. I just announced um, it's called the Marvelers. It's sort of my answer to Harry Potter. Um, uh, it is set in a magic institute that moves around the world in the sky. And it's like the global UN of magic schools. Mm. So, and it's about a little girl. She comes from a community. The, there is a magical community called Marvelers. And then there's the regular community who don't have anything marvelous about them other, you know, in the terms of magic. And she comes from a magical adjacent community and she's the first of her group to be able to go to this magic school. The magic school has been segregated for a long time and they haven't included a certain group of people into the magical community. And so now she gets to be the first student. And so she's both famous and, and reviled. Wow. Uh, so, and also people just don't understand and they're afraid of her. So this is my sort of I wanted to talk about school segregation without talking mm -hmm. about school segregation <laughs> and talk about it magically so that kids can learn that we've done stuff historically to keep people in silos and not allow them to go to school together and have that conversation um, about why we do that, how that happens, so on and so forth. So, and mm -hmm. it's my answer to my answer to Harry and how I always felt like, of course, uh, she who shall not be named, um, created a world that is loved by lots of people. But I thought that if I was a kid and I went to Hogwarts, I would have to do colonial magic because I come from a magical community. And so I would have to go to Hogwarts and give up those and learn those spells and leave the wonderful spells and the things that I do in my household mm -hmm. and the magic I have in my household behind in order to participate in the wizarding world. And I wanted to create a world where all the children around the world can come with their marvelous things, their marvels, which is their magic, all of the things that are wonderful about them and have this sort of cross pollination in a global community and talk about how we function together and how we might, um, how we can do better to do that, make space for each other 
and each other's magic and we don't there isn't just one way to do a thing there's multiple ways so i'm super yeah. excited it's still yeah, just a fun story lovely yeah i still fun have to concept. learn how to talk about it because no hard. you're doing great i i um i we're coming up on our time you know to wrap up there's so okay. much i would love to talk about um about how speculative fiction can sometimes get at real world issues um you know even better than realistic fiction and um that's yeah that's a really exciting concept um we did have a question from the chat that I'll okay. ask, you know, and knowing that we're we're right up against that time, but someone okay. um, asked, do you have a favorite historical story that you haven't used in your own fiction or something that you're trying to figure out what to do with? Historical story? Mm -hmm. hmm. Like some inspiration from a from a historical source that that's really lights you up but that you haven't had a chance to play with yet. Absolutely. I think right now, because history influences me a lot, um, I am, my family is from Mississippi in the Mississippi Delta and Louisiana area and North Carolina. And so I have a lot of projects that I'm working on that will be coming out of New Orleans and that area of the world, which the Marvelers does have a part pieces of that. And I'm very interested in sort of how societies are formed uh, with different groups of people, but also how sort of the French and sort of intermingling with um, the English and then how they transported people here and how this mingling of cultures. So right now I've been bit by the New Orleans bug. So I have a short story coming out in a collection in a couple of weeks called Vampires Never Get Old, thinking about what does vampirism look like in communities of color. And so it, my story is called The House of Black Sapphires. And I really looked at um, the history of, of sort of apothecaries and I made them of course magical and full of vampires. But <laughs> um, so I got really bit by this like idea of these old fashioned medicines and old fashioned um, tonics. And even if they were snake oil, <laughs> I got, I went down the rabbit hole of sort of old remedies and I tried to like blend like vampires history of apothecaries and, and medicines and, and, the, and the rural South and where my family's from all together. I have a strange brain. That yeah. sounds really cool. So <laughs> I'm down that rabbit hole right now. Um, well, Danielle, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, I feel like we barely scratched the surface, but it's been really great talking with you. And um, I want to remind everybody that we'll be back here next week at the same time, Wednesdays at four with Nikki Grimes. And we're very excited to have her as well. So I love um, Nikki Grimes. She's yes. the best. <laughs> Can't wait. Um, so thank you so much, Danielle. And if there's anything, I I'll give you a chance to say final thought or last word if you're interested. Sure. Thank you so much for viewings. Thank you so much for reading my books and giving my little world a shot. I appreciate it. Librarians are the best people in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chicago is a fabulous city. I can't wait till COVID is over and I can come for a visit and get some good pizza. I'm ready. Sounds great. <laughs> All right. Signing off. Thanks, guys. <laughs>